it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I would like to congratulate the Federation for developing this, this call to action. I think it's very important. I will come back to that later. Okay, you have asked me to set the scene for AMR. And it's a little bit like this meeting room. It's a little bit dark. And I will show you some figures because the picture is not very positive. I had an interview with BBC and they asked me, so tell me what are the diseases, what are the severe diseases related to AMR? And I told them, you know, it's not about diseases, it's about bacteria. And then I realized again, this is not an easy narrative, it's always difficult to explain that. But let's have a look at Klebsiella. This is a bacteria that can cause bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections. But if you have this bacteria and it's a carbapenem resistant, the mortality rate is about 50%. 50%. And I show you data here from ECDC that shows you that in a couple of years, the areas that are red are really popping up here. And it's a very, very serious situation. So the resistance here is more than 50% in several of these red uh, color-coded countries. Now, another bacteria, um, a bacter, is again causes urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, and again a high mortality in hospitalized patients. And look here at the picture. It's amazing. It's overwhelming the red. This is the reality. This is the reality nowadays in Europe. And it's not better than other parts of the world, but we have quite reliable data from Europe. This is the last example I would like to show you. This is MRSA, the hospital superbug. But there is also positive news here. And if you look at the map, you can see that UK was red, but is nowadays um, is yellow. So and this is a very important message. Because if you really would like to pay, if you are going to pay attention to this phenomenon, you can do something, you can change the tide. And I think we all need to keep that in memory, because this is important. Now TV, only 25% of the multi-drug resistant TB cases are discovered, only 25%. 80% of the 25 get treatment and I think about 50% will pass away, will die. This is incredible. So we all need to pay attention, in particular here for TB, on the diagnostic part. Now this is a picture from gonorrhea. We have almost 80 million new cases a year. Now we all know that the treatment for gonorrhea is a combination of two antimicrobials. But we have seen recently new cases that are both resistant for these two antimicrobials. And the treatment was a kind of experimental treatment, um, but it's, and there's a very limited evidence for this treatment, so there is a real need for new antibiotics, in particular for gonorrhea, and I come back to that. Now, if you have a new antibiotic, I think we need to keep in mind that it should be affordable for everyone who needs these new antimicrobials. And of course, we need to pay attention to education. Now, another example is typhoid fever. Again, almost 20 million cases a year. And 2,000 deaths, 200,000 deaths a year. 
Now, I think this picture shows that, again, vulnerable populations are in the low and middle income countries. Now, we have seen multi drug resistant uh, salmonella typhi. They are increasing and they are in parts of Asia and Africa. Of course, reduced susceptibility for the fluoroquinolones, but now, recently, we have seen XDR uh, salmonella typhi in Pakistan. This is a very serious situation. Uh, this is the first big outbreak of the spread of this XDR. Um, and we have seen now over 300 cases, but I'm sure that this is only the tip of the iceberg. Now, what can we do about it? Vaccination. But also, and this is always good to keep in mind, very basic things like access to safe drinking water, sewage system, all these basic things, to train people, food handlers, health education. This is important. And that's why I'm very happy to be here, because I count on you. So AMR is one of the biggest threats to modern medicine. And I dare to say that there are a lot of similarities with the climate change. Very complex. Now, we all know that the factors contributing to AMR is the overuse, it's the misuse. And it's also mentioned here that the rise of the demand for, uh, for uh, antibiotics will, will grow because there will be a rise in demand for animal proteins. And in particular, in countries like China and India, you will see that there will be a huge increase in the use of antimicrobials, in particular, if nothing will change, in agriculture. Now we are talking these days about SDGs, very important for a UN organization. But if we are not able to combat AMR, several SDGs will be affected. Not only number three, that is about good health, but also six, clean water, and also food security. Now that's why the World Health Assembly has developed a global action plan three years ago. And there are five objectives, and I think you all know these objectives. And I will show you a little bit of the current situation. First of all, improve awareness and understanding. We had about more than 130 countries who were doing, participating in a national antimicrobial awareness campaign. That was a very good result. But I have seen this in Thailand, and I don't know whether there is someone here from Thailand. Can you raise your hand if you are from Thailand? No? Okay. But I can tell you this was so impressive. It was during the PMAC meeting, the field visit. And these people are community health workers. But they have really trained everyone in the community to understand that you do not need antimicrobials for diarrhea, for upper respiratory tract infection. Just follow. Don't forget, follow, follow the patient. That's all you need to do. And they have other very nice uh, diagnostic tools. I can't go into detail now. And the good thing here is that they really involve the community. This is a, a monk here, and school children are, are reading from uh, school books. I think this is one of the best examples in the world I have seen. Now, surveillance. I'm very pleased that about almost uh, 70 countries are now enrolled in the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System, the GLASS. Uh, we have presented uh, together with uh, Sweden at, at the PMAC meeting uh, the first results and we will show more results the uh, coming month. These are is the map of the countries that are enrolled and you can see that you know, we are making quite some uh, progress. Now, reduce incidence of infection and other 
cornerstone of the fight against AMR. And it's in your hands to prevent sepsis in healthcare. Three weeks ago, we had the Clean Your Hands campaign. I think you all know about this. Uh, this is the hand hygiene, and uh, you know, I think, also these uh, flyers. And again, this is still extremely important. And I was so pleased to meet this nurse in Nairobi. Who is, she has a shirt with, I think you can see that, infection prevention and control. And she was extremely kind of brave and proud that she was trying to keep everyone on track, the doctors on track. And that's not so easy, as some of you know. And from WHO, we really would like to involve nurses and midwives in, you know, this whole fight against AMR. Now, stewardship is important. Now, I can show you another slide, but I found this slide, I don't know whether this is from Céline uh, Puccini, but I put her name here. And it's just, you know, are antimicrobials needed? What is the spectrum that we need to discover? How long? Etc. This is basic antimicrobial stewardship. But it's not that often applied in a healthcare setting, both community and in a hospital setting. This is another amazing t-shirt, fever is not a sign of self trioxone deficiency. I think we could use that here. Now, I was, um, I think two months ago in Paris for the Pasteur uh, course on AMR, and I met my colleague uh, Kamini Varia, and she so showed slides from the situation in her home country, and I asked her whether I could show a few slides. And this is the trend of antibiotic consumption in India. And you can see that there is a sharp increase in cephalosporins, a very dramatic increase. This here is another slide. It's about the market forces in this country. And I'm not sure whether this is unique in India. I think there are several other countries. There's a lack of widespread availability of narrow spectrum uh, antimicrobials. And, and we know, as WHO, we know very well that this is a big issue and we are discussing how to solve this. It's not that easy, by the way. Then availability of oral penem, imipenem has increased in four years by 150%. And there are a lot of what we call irrational fixed dose combinations and they are heavily prescribed. Often they are not registered. And, and I think this is not very clear, but the bar chart shows the companies that are manufacturing these, um, these antimicrobials. And I think the first one is Ceftriaxone. More than 100 companies. It's really amazing. And this is the last one about the social economic factors. It's self-medication. Um, it's also a demand for quick relief, but this is nothing unique in India. This is happening in all countries. People want to get antibiotics. Um, diagnostic uncertainty. Yesterday night we had a workshop on diagnostics. And I think this is very important. But of course, this is not often applied. There is too much uh, broad spectrum antibiotics uh, are, are used. And something, maybe, it's not so easy to say that here in this building, but I do. The incentives offered by pharmaceutical companies to doctors and pharmacists to prescribe new antibiotics. And this is undermining stewardship. This is undermining the guidelines. The aware classification that we have developed. And I got this picture from, I think it was an intern, and she showed that the good news is that any medical representative is not allowed to enter this, uh, this cabinet of a doctor. At the same time, she saw many beautiful art pieces on the wall, and they all are gifts from the industry. This is a reality. Okay, of course we need to develop new antimicrobials. 
But it's not very promising, not at all. We have developed a list of priority pathogens. We have checked. There are 33 um, new uh, antimicrobials in the pipeline. Nine are innovative, but we think that only one or two will make it in three years. Now, I told you about gonorrhea. Now, we have initiated uh, the GARD initiative, that's a partnership to develop new antimicrobials, in particular for low uh, resource settings. And I'm very glad that the first product, the first agreement that they have is about the new antimicrobial for gonorrhea. Okay, the One Health. I just got a signal that I need to hurry up, sorry. Now, I think uh, this was also mentioned uh, by, by the previous speaker about the use in agriculture. Now, the WHO has developed guidelines for medically important antimicrobials that are used in food producing animals. And I think the bottom line is you should not use antimicrobials as growth promoter nor as preventive in preventive use. Only when there is a certain uh, very clear reason. Now, this is a picture I got um, I, I had it for a long time, but I got it uh, last week from my friend uh, Bruno uh, Gonzalez in, uh, in Spain. Now, we all know that Spain is, has a very high consumption of antimicrobials, in, uh, in particular in the pig sector, and this is the cost of consumption, very high. I think it's the highest in Europe. And you think, how can they change that? But they did. And this is a very hopeful message. There was an agreement for voluntary reduction of cholesterol. And this is the result. There is a very clear reduction, 82%. And there was no increase in alternative antimicrobials. So, this is really important. The beef from Namibia, the pressure from consumer groups is important. We have now more than 170 countries with their national action plan. But I count on you, because you can make a difference. Only prescribe antimicrobials when necessary. And educate your patients, educate your people. I'm very glad that there's a minister here. But there's a huge responsibility. Also to vaccinate patients, to follow diagnostic procedures. And the political commitment is so important. And you could reach out to the political level if you are not yourself a politician. So it's time for education, action, and we need to change our behavior. Political commitment is important. Financial and human resources. Ownership of a government. That's why I'm so glad that the Minister of Ghana is here. A very important country. And we need to monitor the the results. So, WHO is very pleased with this call for action on antimicrobial resistance and we fully support that. And I would like to convey a message from our DG, Dr. Tedros. Congratulations for your work and underline the WHO invitation to work together even more than we did in the past. Thank you so much.